I would also like to mention the fact that both WDM Bell and Tony Sanchez mentioned that bullets with very high velocity are more likely to deflect. Tony Sanchez mentions specifically that the 460 Weatherby is prone to deflection. You have to remember though that when the 460 Weatherby was introduced, bullet technology wasn't that good. So when you have bullets that may deform or come apart at regular 458 wind mag speeds, it's easy to see that greatly increased velocity can increase deformation and consequently deflection. The weight and shape of a bullet is very important for penetration. Obviously light pointed bullets are a poor choice because they are relatively easy to deflect. Round nose bullets have deeper penetration through barriers like bone and wood than flat nose bullets do. With soft substances like flush or ballistics gel, round nose bullets tend to deviate more easily and don't go as deep as wide flat nose bullets do. Obviously wide flat nose bullets make a larger wound than a round nose one which doesn't matter for brain shots, but matters somewhat for heart or lung shots. There is a less common type of non-expanding bullet known as the cup nose, and it does the most damage of all non-expanding bullets. I'm afraid I don't know for sure how they compare in penetration of flesh or bone to the previously mentioned rounds. I will warn against using cup nose bolts for headshots on elephants though. I talk about penetration in soft substances and hard barriers separately because they can be quite different. For example, you can have a plus P hard cast lead 9mm round, and when you shoot it into clear ballistics gel, it can actually penetrate deeper out of a handgun barrel than with a 16 inch carbine barrel. Likewise, if you have a steel cord 50 BMG round, it can go through very thick barriers but penetrate less water jugs than some handgun rounds do. In conclusion, either a round nose bullet or a regular flat nose are the most suitable for headshots on elephants. One last thing about velocity, caliber, and deflection. Bell essentially said that with the 7mm 200 grain bullets he was using, that they were very good at penetrating straight and reliably hitting the elephant's brain. He said that this was due to their bullet having a moderate velocity of 2,300 feet per second and that the diameter to length ratio was ideal. I want to break this down a bit. With non-expanding round nose bullets like he was using, increasing velocity increases both penetration in bone or wood and the tendency for a bullet to deflect. There is an interesting article from Outdoor Life that describes the test of bullet deflection in brush. This test determined higher velocity undoubtedly increases the chance of deflection when all other factors are equal. With the smaller 6.5x54 bullets, Bell found that they were bending when shot into heavy bones. As a side note, with today's monolithic bullets, I doubt that this would be a problem anymore. Heavy bones, for example, would be the solid bone of an elephant's femur. I generally think it's a bad idea to try to break an elephant's leg with any caliber. Just imagine trying to cut down a tree with rifle bullets. However, a leg shot might be necessary if you have to stop a wounded elephant from escaping. That would be shooting at the elephant's back leg as he is running away. And I should mention that a rear brain shot on a fleeing elephant would be better, but it may not be practical in the case that you have only a split second to shoot before the elephant disappears into thick brush. And if we are only talking about breaking bone and not penetration, the largest calibers have the advantage. With both greater momentum and greater diameter, this means that more of the energy actually goes into damaging the bone instead of just penetrating through it. Since I mentioned that fairly small 6.5mm bullets can deform in heavy bone, I figured I should mention that with really large calibers like the 4-bore, you'll have even worse deformation problems. Even in just clear ballistics gelatin, flat nose hard cast lead rounds noticeably expand somewhat. The round nose ones penetrate deeper in ballistics gel because they don't do this. In Cape Buffalo, for example, any hard cast round seems to deform significantly when it hits bone. Obviously, the large caliber of the bullet makes these rounds especially prone to deformation. With a round nose 4 bore, penetration through bone is extremely questionable, and I obviously don't think it'd be nearly enough for a frontal shot on a large elephant. 
Remember, the smaller 10 bore doesn't even have enough penetration for this shot. I said before that larger calibers have the advantage when you need to break an elephant's leg, and this can include shotgun rounds. We have a forum post of a man who stopped an elephant charge with a shotgun round to the leg. This round was a one ounce spherical ball made out of hard lead. Obviously when an elephant charges, you should aim for the brain, not the leg. This was a rare exception to that rule. Inevitably someone will say that I don't know what I'm talking about and that I'm just going to get people killed because I say small caliber bullets can kill elephants. First of all, if I was just an opinionated, uninformed person, I wouldn't have taken so much time to do all this research and give nuanced details. Second of all, everything I have said is backed up with evidence and solid reasoning. If you want to prove me wrong and change my mind about any of the things I've said, all you need to do is provide sufficient evidence that I'm wrong. What will not change my mind is if you simply state that you believe I'm wrong and that I should look for examples that prove you right. All that does is prove that you have no evidence to show me and that you are dismissing all the evidence that I have provided. It is also quite clear that things are a bit more complex than big calibers kill elephants and little calibers don't. I will provide yet another case where a large caliber rifle failed to stop a charging elephant. Bill Judd fired four shots of 577 at the elephant. The elephant then killed Bill. Bill's son then shot and killed the elephant with a brain shot. I'm afraid I don't have the details of where exactly the 577 rounds hit, but I'm sure you get the point regardless. One more thing, in the olden days a man using only a small caliber rifle to kill elephants was a sign of experience. Much like it is today, the novice would only believe that large caliber rifles must be used on elephant. Things have somewhat changed these days as novice poachers use AK-47s and experienced elephant colors may use 308 rifles. Meanwhile, both the novice hunter and the professional hunter or guide typically use large caliber rifles. This is a somewhat abbreviated account of a Cape Buffalo hunt gone wrong. As you can see, even my abbreviated version is a lot to read. Anyway, it involves a hunter and his reckless guide following a buffalo shot through the lungs with the 375 into thick grass. Predictably, this didn't go well. The guide was badly gored while the hunter emptied his rifle more than once into the buffalo to no immediate effect. The guide later died from these injuries and the hunter was mostly unharmed. A lot of people would look at this case and their initial reaction is, Cape Buffalo are so tough they can easily take a dozen 375 H&H rounds, so I should get a 458 or something else even bigger. See the assumption here? That you should get a bigger caliber even though large caliber bolt action rifles will still only hold a few rounds, which is in my opinion not really enough if things go wrong. If you want to keep reading this story, pause the video now because I'm going to move on. When we step up to even more powerful cartridges, we see the same thing still happening. An example of this would be the case where Dr. Kevin Robertson and his client shot a Cape Buffalo a total of 11 times with a 458 lot and a 505 Gibbs, and it still charged them. This included them hitting the vitals multiple times, of course. With more information from Peter Capstick and John Taylor, we can correctly diagnose this problem being caused by biology instead of inadequate caliber. It is not specific to Cape Buffalo, obviously. A lion, for example, can have a massive hole blown through its heart and still have enough oxygen in its body to charge you and tear you to pieces. When an animal has a lot of adrenaline throwing through its body, this can cause an increased amount of oxygen in the blood and little to no response to pain. Adrenaline aside, let's say you go into full cardiac arrest and your heart is not beating at all. You actually don't drop dead immediately when this happens. What actually happens is that the oxygen in your blood is used up and you only fall unconscious when your brain runs out of oxygen. So if a bigger caliber is not the answer, what is? Regardless of what animal wants to kill you, the answer is a brain or spine shot. To make a quick brain shot on a charging animal is difficult, but with a weapon like a shotgun, it gives you a much greater room for error due to the spread of its pellets. This is why for many African guides, shotguns are the preferred tool for following after wounded leopards and for protection against charging lions. 
Rust Broom uses a 10 gauge loaded with 3.5 inch shells, but I think that is just high recoil overkill. Regular 12 gauge double op buckshot shells will do the job, but as always, I think hard cast lead buck is better. Sir Alfred Pease wrote that for line, he preferred a light and handy 256 man liquor rifle. For charging lions at close range, he preferred small buckshot or large birdshot. Like I said before, it's extremely foolish to use birdshot on lions. Hippo skulls can be easily penetrated with 22 rifle rounds, so hard cast lead buckshot would also work. However, since hippos are so large, buckshot can be totally ineffective if you are forced to take a body shot at a bad angle. An example of this if the hippo is facing another person while it attacks them and not charging straight at you. This need for penetration is why people like Tony Tomkinson prefer really deep penetrating rounds like 375 h and full metal jackets. I would also say that we know smaller rounds like 303 or 308 penetrate fairly deep. While a flat nose 308 for example can't give full body length penetration on a large hippo that is in excess of 11 feet long, it will give you adequate penetration with most angles. I believe a semi-auto 308 would be best suited for this task because of the reasons I mentioned before about fairly low recoil and fast follow-up shots, though you could make an argument that a semi-auto in a different caliber would be best. If you are a game ranger of some sort and you are frequently required to take shots at, with the worst angles possible, 375 H&H has a clear advantage compared to other large calibers like 458 Win Mag because it offers both excellent penetration and manageable recoil. I want to mention a side note about the quote about using 303 on elephants. If we assume that Dennis Lyell used 215 grain round nose 303 bullets, which would be available as military ammunition and preferred for their deep penetration. We can confidently say that a 220 grain hard cast lead flat nose 308 bullet will penetrate deeper in flesh. I say this based on the superior bullet shape and better momentum to caliber ratio of this 308 round. Keep in mind that this is a prediction and that predictions can be wrong because of unexpected variables. Also, with such a long bullet in a 308 case, the bullet will be probably taking up some of the powder space which will reduce velocity. Finally, people could also make the argument that the best gun for hippo defense would be a drilling gun. Such a weapon would have either two rifle barrels in a shotgun barrel, or two shotgun barrels in a rifle barrel chambered in a caliber like 9.3 by 74 r it's obvious that this sort of weapon is not as popular as it used to be, probably due to things like weight and cost. I know I've been talking about elephants for most of this video, but I have one more thing to add. Kevin Robertson has a game ranger friend in Kruger National Park who uses a 404 Jeffrey rifle. This 450 grain Sambo solid bullet loaded at 2150 feet per second gives full body penetration on elephants. The way I see this is that if you want a large caliber, you don't have to go any larger than the 404 Jeffrey because it has all the penetration and consequently effectiveness that you'll ever need. As a side note, since you can find 416 Rigby rounds with similar momentum to this 404, I'd like to see a side-by-side -side penetration comparison between the two. The reason why this would be interesting to see is because with a smaller diameter bullet and the same momentum, this 416 Rigby should penetrate even farther. For Cape Buffalo defense, I recommend a 308 semi auto as well. If you hit just the skull and not any horn, you can easily penetrate the brain even if you have a small, high velocity bullet. I have an example of this happening with a water buffalo shot in the front of the skull with a 243 hollow point. With Cape Buffalo, it's obviously more difficult to penetrate through the thick boss and into the skull. For those of you who aren't familiar, the boss is the thick keratin covered plate on top of the buffalo skull where the horns meet. I have little confidence that expanding bullets of any kind could penetrate through this, so solids are mandatory. Occasionally you'll find someone who believes that non-expanding bullets aren't good for a buffalo because they don't do much damage. 
This is partially true because for hunting specifically, you want your first shot to be both well placed and to be an expanding round like a Nosler partition or an acubond. After you fire that first shot, the majority of the time that buffalo is going to turn and run away. This means that to reach the vitals, you'll probably need to penetrate lengthwise through the animal, and you can only expect a non-expanding bullet, like a Barnes banded solid for example, to do this. And like I said before, if the buffalo charges, you want a solid for penetrating into the brain. Finally, if you want a non-expanding bullet that does more damage, choose a cup nose. I don't want to give you just my perspective, however. Professional hunter Mark Sullivan uses a double rifle and 577 Nitro Express, and believes that with such a rifle, you should wait until the charging buffalo gets to about 10 feet before you shoot it in the brain. The reasoning he has given is that if you fire both shots at a longer range, you may not stop the charge because it's simply too far away to make good hits. This would put you in the situation where you can't reload in time to kill the buffalo before he kills you. I am aware of the controversy around him, and I only mentioned his perspective because he is one of the guys that has taken the time to explain his opinion on the specifics of dangerous game defense. I have a much higher opinion of another professional hunter named Nathan Askew. He explained that he uses a 470 double rifle and that he has taken the sling mounts off because slings get caught on stuff and the rifle should be in your hands anyway. He has also added a Picatinny rail on the underside of his rifle to mount a flashlight on because they've had problems with lions at night. I find this part very interesting because Alaskan bear guides have done the exact same thing as I've mentioned in another video. Nathan Askew also says that you shouldn't avoid buying a dangerous game rifle just because it's a push feed. He also says that controlled round feed rifles are better because of the larger extractors that help overcome dirt or grime. I wholeheartedly agree with both of these statements and I want to take a minute to talk about controlled round versus push feed rifles. I have two examples of extractor breakage slash failure that I am showing you. The first was an FN made controlled round feed in 375 H and H. The second was a Remington 700 push feed rifle in 416 Remington. It's obvious that a larger and stronger extractor can help, but for both types of rifles to fail in this manner leads me to believe that controlled round feed is not the massive advantage some would want you to believe it is. In the case of the 416, we can definitively say that the rounds were loaded too hot. This deformed the brass, and this is what caused the failure. While a larger extractor is undoubtedly an advantage, it's definitely not a guarantee that the casing will be extracted. So if your rifle is useless and your life is on the line, it's a good idea to have a handgun as a backup. A lot of the debate around controlled versus push feed devolves into a discussion of theoretical situations. I'd like to avoid the theoretical situations for the most part and mention one person's practical experience with both types of rifles. He has found that both types of rifles can fail and both types of rifles can be extremely reliable. Second of all, the conventional wisdom is that controlled feed rifles will work upside down and at any angle while push feed doesn't. The reality is that push feed rifles like Sako, Tika, and Sauer all work from any position as well. Finally, this person has intentionally tried to knock a loose round out of push feed rifles by swinging them from side to side. This sort of movement never knocks the round loose, it only ends up putting the round into the chamber of the rifle. I actually tried a similar sort of thing with a pump action shotgun with its action open. Even though the round has plenty of room to move around, it takes a fairly deliberate motion at a certain angle to knock the round out of the shotgun. This is an example of why conventional wisdom is overly simplistic and isn't even logically consistent. Pump action shotguns, which are push feed operated, are viewed as incredibly reliable, and bolt action rifles are only viewed as incredibly reliable when they are controlled round feed. This same person also mentioned that they could load controlled round feed rifles much easier than a push feed. This is because push feed rifles like Tika, Sako, and Sauer have a narrow ejection port that makes loading harder. If you remember, Don Heath had a similar sort of complaint that Remington 700 rifles took longer to load. 
Also, this person noticed that he could fire push feed rifles faster than controlled feed rifles of the same caliber. Now this person didn't explain why this was happening, but it was because push feed rifles usually have a plunger ejector that gets rid of the spent casing out of the action sooner. Since the ejector removes the casing faster, this actually decreases the chance that a short stroke will jam the rifle, whereas controlled feed requires the bolt to be fully to the rear before it can eject the cartridge. There are many controlled round feed rifles that do not allow you to put a round directly into the chamber. This is obviously a problem if you need to reload a round quickly. There are exceptions to this rule, of course. Next, I want to mention the fact that poachers frequently use AK-47s to kill elephants. This is by itself not that surprising because a precise heart shot with almost any caliber that has good penetration can kill an elephant. What is more surprising is that an elephant was killed with two 7.62 by 39 rounds to the head. Although this elephant wasn't particularly large, being only 10 years old, this demonstrates that 7.62 by 39 can kill smaller elephants with brain shots. I don't have enough details to know whether this was a frontal shot or not, so I don't think a regular 762 by 39 can penetrate into the frontal skull of a large elephant. Some people will inevitably claim that 762 by 39 is completely inadequate for killing elephants, and that's why poachers need so many rounds to kill one, but I think the facts suggest otherwise. I am showing a poaching report that was posted on Quora in which 14 762 by 39 rounds were fired and 7 elephants were killed. An average of 2 rounds per elephant suggests that many poachers may be generally limited by their lack of markmanship instead of the 762 by 39 rounds they may use. Since I just mentioned poaching, I want to highlight the fact that poaching will remain a threat to African elephants until something changes. We have two possible solutions to this problem as far as I can tell. Either you try to change the laws to completely ban possession of ivory in countries like Vietnam and China, or you try to use an international ivory trade ban to collapse the price of ivory and reduce the demand. It's important to remember that demand is the problem, because demand is what fuels the black markets and pays the poachers. What is not the problem is legitimate big game hunters who are common in countries like the US who would like to bring back the ivory from the elephant they shot. Legitimate hunters are obviously limited by laws and are not going to kill an unlimited number of elephants just to sell the ivory. Also, the money that legitimate hunters spend on these expensive hunts goes right to conservation and protection of those animals. Remember, there are two opposing forces here. Dollars and demand for legitimate hunting, which are pitted against the dollars and demand for black market ivory. Because of the laws in certain Asian countries, they can't distinguish easily between legal and illegally tamed ivory. The result is that legal sale of ivory provides cover for poached ivory. It's also a good idea to try your best to reduce poverty in Africa so people can live decently without having to poach elephants. It appears that such practical solutions are being largely ignored by activist individuals in favor of moral crusade against trophy hunting and eating meat. A lot of people have a surface level understanding of conservation, so they can be swayed by emotion and ideological arguments. I want to give an example of a very successful conservation project, and the reason why southern white rhinos were saved from the brink of extinction. It was because these rhinos were given to private landowners. These landowners had an incentive to care for the rhinos because hunters would pay a lot of money to hunt them. Most people assume hunting is at odds with conservation, but they really go hand in hand. Without conservation, there is no hunting, and without hunting, there is no conservation. Many people won't believe me when I say that without hunting, there is no conservation, so I have a very clear-cut example. All hunting in Kenya was banned in 1977, and the result was disastrous. Poachers went into previously controlled hunting areas and killed animals indiscriminately and barbarically. It is estimated that since 1977, Kenya has lost 60 to 70 percent of all of its large wildlife due to this law. Thanks for watching this video, and I hope you'll consider subscribing.